Hello, my name is David Kruglensky, and welcome to the J-Robot tutorial. Uh, I am the inventor of J-Robot. I've been a Georgia teacher for 11 years, and before that I was a computer programmer. So I programmed the video based on my needs in the classroom. As a teacher, I never liked instructional videos. And I never liked it when people came to the school to lecture me. I did not have time for it. I was way too busy. My students needed me and there was never enough time. But I am going to ask you to invest just a little time watching this whole video because I promise I'm going to give that time back to you and then some. In fact, one of the important functions of JRobot educational software is making things easier and more time efficient and saving you time as well as providing a new and technological um, new component of differentiated instruction. Okay, so let's take a look at how to use the software. Let's turn on JRobot. So I'm going to click the JRobot icon. Hopefully your IT person put JRobot directly on the desktop so that students can begin right away and it's easy for them. I'm going to click Start and if the students are experienced with JRobot they would go right here and these are your easier sixth grade earth science lessons. They all have a read aloud accommodation. These are the more advanced sixth grade earth science lessons. Many of them do not have a read aloud accommodation. And studies show that if students always have things read to them, then they start to rely on that and they're not doing their own reading. So it's important to have a mix of some assignments with a read aloud accommodation and some assignments where you're kind of forced to do the reading yourself. These are some bonus STEM lessons, a really nice um, practice with fractions, some, some engineering lessons that uh, tie in very nicely with the eighth grade standards of Georgia. But let's pretend that it's the very first time the students are going to use JRobot educational software. In that case, you need to click cl right here. Click here if you are new to JRobot, the piece of paper that's not folded into anything with skill. So uh, let's get started here. And I got this idea from Angry Birds. Angry Birds does not have instructions that are in text. Rather, it's just pictures. It's just trial and error. And um, there's several studies that show students don't like to read instructions. They like to click around to figure something out. So that's what this is. It's a simple match game to get you in the mindset of how to use JRobot software. The idea of matching things that are together and making them disappear. Okay, this is a little bit different, and that's uh, created strategically to get the students to understand that the match game is going to change, it's going to have different rules, and you have to be kind of alert to that. So I'm going to get through that pretty quickly. And so far the students are like, I thought this is science class. We haven't done anything related to science. But it kind of wades you into that. Now that I understand the concept, concept of the match game, maybe I can match this image with the words Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, or Jupiter. Maybe I know that that's Mercury and I get that one right. Maybe I know this is Earth and I get that one right. But maybe I have no idea what that is. Is it Venus? And there's some text that kind of gives me um, a little hint that that's not correct. And eventually I get it right. And I start to figure out you got to always match information. The picture of Venus matches with the word of Venus. The picture of Mars matches with the words of Mars. If it looks like I just don't know the planets at all, it's going to make me repeat the lesson. However, if I did a very good job, it would advance me very quickly to more advanced levels. So now let me get a very good score so it advances me forward. And it tells me the number of clicks are being counted, so I need to get that done really well. Now the match game changes a little bit. 
and there's a new planet. Now it's instead of matching five things, it's matching six things. So it's progressively getting more difficult depending on my ability. Oh, and I just used the software incorrectly and this screen comes up telling me always click top to bottom, top to bottom, top to bottom and it's very important that the students are doing that. You can't just click up here and then start clicking every single option. That's not right. You have to match Venus with Venus. You have to match Jupiter with Jupiter. Okay, I didn't do so very well, but now I'm going to do great so we can see what happens next. I'm basically clicking top to bottom, top to bottom, matching the picture of Jupiter with the word Jupiter. And now here are all eight planets. It says, let's see if you can match all planets of the solar system. And if I do it wrong, if I say I have no idea what that is, I'm going to keep clicking all the things down here. Uh, that doesn't work. I have to match the image of Neptune with the word Neptune to make that match disappear. OK, you can see I have these all memorized. And now, because I do, it says, can you do the same round but without the pictures? Good luck. So now, for the first time, I'm actually forced to read something. I can't get past this round without, without actually doing some reading. But because I had some success and I've gotten to this point so far, I'm encouraged to do this and to succeed with it. So even if I hate reading, I'm probably going to read just a few words just to get it right. And that is how J-Robot teaches the planets. Some people don't like to begin the school year with the planets. They save it until December, they save it until March, but to use J-Robot properly it's important just to start with J-Robot with the planets. Um, it doesn't hurt to have one or two days where you learn about the planets of the solar system and then spend the rest of the time learning about it in March. In fact, it is more likely to be stored in long-term memory if you learned it a little bit in August and then you learn it more in December or in March. But the astronomy lesson is the most structured lesson in all of the software, so it is important as a tutorial uh, to start with the planets, at least have a day or two of it um, so the students get used to the software. Okay, let's look at another feature. For this feature, I'm going to show uh, a lesson on soil. Um, as a sixth grade science teacher, a, a lot of my students read at a sixth grade level, but a few of them read at a second or third grade level. So it was hard to differentiate instruction. I always wished for a second textbook that taught at an easier reading level. So J-Robot provides that. Um, these three paragraphs are written with an easier vocabulary. Uh, it's a larger font. And also it's more laser focused on the Georgia standards. Unlike the textbook, which has a lot of extra information, which isn't going to appear on the Georgia milestone, uh, this is very focused on what the students need to know to do well. Notice the read to me button. So there's a read aloud accommodation. This will all be read out loud and I recommend um, passing out headphones to the students that, that need the read aloud accommodation or require it and no headphones for the students that, that shouldn't have it. So there's three paragraphs there. There's another three paragraphs and then when they're done reading we're on to the quiz already. And I created this because I noticed I had some students who learned very quickly in my class. You can't uh, fool around during reading time. You can't be looking out the window. You can't be passing notes. I would catch that. So the students would learn how to fool me. They would be super quiet. Their eyes would be on the textbook, but they weren't actually reading. They were just fake reading. And then in a couple weeks, I'd give them a quiz, and they'd get a 25 on it, revealing that they hadn't learned anything because they weren't doing anything. So this software helps solve that problem. You are required to read just six paragraphs, and if you decided not to do that, if you decided to fake it, it's time to catch that right now. 
So here's the quiz. It's a simple quiz. If you really did the reading, it's not hard. But let's pretend that I was faking it and I just have no idea what the answer is. So I'm going to click a wrong answer on purpose. And it doesn't give me a big red X and a buzzer and make me feel bad. It says, actually, that's a pretty good answer. However, there's a better answer below. But because I didn't do the reading, I'm just going to have to click around until I find the answer. And there it is. Notice the quiz is also uh, with a read aloud accommodation if you need it. Um, let me get the rest of these questions right just so we can go through this pretty quickly. So a lot of my students would say, oh, my, my grades are 75. I passed. Great. We're done. But no, the software sets a very high bar. This was an easy quiz. You should have got 100. And we are going to demand 100. So since you didn't get 100, you get a motivational quote on persistence. And you have to do the reading all over again. I suggest this time you really read. Maybe the student... Uh, doesn't do that. In that case, they're going to get a um, score less than 100 again, and they're going to have to take this quiz over and over and over. Keep going back to the reading until they eventually cave in and say, okay, I'll really do the reading just so I can get through this quiz. And that's actually um, quite a breakthrough when you get a student to, to start doing what they're supposed to do. So I'm going to get 100 this time. And it says, congratulations, you've mastered the standard. There's another motivational quote. But you see this little box right here? This is kind of a secret button for teachers. So if you have anybody missing this video, please tell them about the secret box because that is there for you. So it says the person took uh, the soil quiz and got 100%, but after two attempts. That's really important. A lot of times I have this get populated by a student and I see a lot of sevens and eights. And I say to the student, don't you have a social studies quiz tomorrow? Why don't you go over the social studies facts seven or eight times for homework tonight? Because that seems to be your magic number. It seems like your memory is activated when you go over things seven or eight times. So that's a wonderful thing to show a student because it makes that student metacognitive. It gives the student a strategy. A lot of failing students have no strategy, no idea of how to do homework. They go over things once, they fail the quiz, and they feel stupid. But you have to show them that repeating facts help you memorize those facts. And the software demonstrates that. When you get that 100 and you've been failing all year and it's your first 100 of the year, or your first 100 ever, it really, really feels good. You say, what did I do to get this 100? And it's repeating the information, really doing the reading, not faking anymore, but really, really doing it. So this is the kind of thing that the software does for the student. It, it shows the student a way towards success, and it makes the student metacognitive. Okay, let's go back to the lesson. Because I got a hundred on the quiz, it's now moving me on to something else. I will now be learning about continental drift. So the students that were very good readers, they're on continental drift rather quickly. The students who are, are not learning well, either because of their attitude or they don't feel like doing the reading or they genuinely are having struggles with the reading, they will repeat it over and over until they've got it. Okay, I'm going to show you a feature of JRobot for special education. Let's look at interior of the earth. It's one of the advanced rounds. It does not have the read aloud accommodation, but there's not a lot to read. It's, it's kept pretty briefly. It tells a story. I'm just going to skip through this pretty quickly. And whenever there's a reading assignment, then um, there's a quiz just to make sure you were really doing it. So this is a quiz. It doesn't look like a quiz, but it is. And it's part of differentiated assessment. And you'll find some students do better at some assessments and some do better at the other ones. And JRobot is a way to, to find that out. Anyway, this is a model of the interior of the earth. Click the next button to continue. It says, please click the inner core. If I did the reading, then I can easily uh, do that. 
Correct. The inner core is represented by the yellow center. Please click the outer core. Again, that's easy. Now click the mantle, and that's easy. And then it says, can you click the crust? Maybe 95 or 97 percent of my students can click this very thin layer, uh, which represents the crust. But I noticed that a few of my students kept missing it. They would try to click it, but they would miss it. And when I checked their IEPs, I saw that they had motor skills disability, which means it was difficult for them to precisely move the mouse. They could click very big things, but it was very hard to click small things. So if you have that disability, the software senses it, it detects it, and it makes the crust larger for, just for you. It, it offers an apology right here, and it adjusts the amount of tries, and it adjusts the score for you. And it's going to remember that you need the crust to be a little bit larger, and now it's easy for me to click. What I discovered in my special education inclusion classroom is that some students would get the large crust, but they didn't have anything on their IEP indicating motor skills disability. So I started to watch them and I said, wow, this student has trouble moving the mouse. I should tell the counselor. Now, a motor skills disability isn't something you would normally be uh, tested for unless a teacher recommended it. So JRobot allowed me to make meaningful recommendations. Now, you have to be careful. Some kids just like to click around. It's kind of an attention problem, and they'll get the larger crust for other reasons than motor skills disability. But the software at least gives you a clue uh, to look for that and um, to maybe then recommend uh, the child be tested to the counselor. Okay, something else related to special education. Here a student has been using the software for a while and on the lesson on comets and meteors the student got 100% but after 14 attempts. Anytime you're seeing a number above 10 or 11 attempts um, it, it indicates a student's having trouble with the software. When I see a student has a number like that I like to sit with the student and just make sure they're not being stubborn, that they're learning from their mistakes that they're being creative and finding solutions. Uh, 14 attempts can mean a student who is just not getting the software and, and needs a little bit of coaching. But when I look further, I see it took 14 attempts to do this, and then only five attempts to do this, and then seven, and then six. So th these numbers would indicate a student who was having trouble and then found a solution, and, and it started working for that child. So that, that's good news. But if I saw a lot of 11s, 12s, 13s, 14s, all, all over the board, that might be an indication of a memory disability, and that's important to diagnose. A disability with memory uh, can cause a lot of problems for a student. Very often, a student with this kind of disability will not have their multiplication tables memorized by 6th grade or 7th grade, and, and sometimes they go their whole life not knowing their multiplication tables, which is a, a big problem um, when you want to do well in, in math and algebra with fractions. It's, it's, a, it's a big, big problem. So you want to diagnose it, and you want to start meeting it with accommodations. Very often, a learning disability um, involving memory is due to damage or underdevelopment of the hippocampus. Well the good news is that memory migrates from the hippocampus to other parts of the brain. It takes months to do that, but a student with a memory disability can learn the multiplication tables or, or anything else involving rote memorization. However, they need to spend months on something instead of just a few days or a few weeks uh, to memorize it. Also, a lot of times when a child has a memory disability, the problem interferes with the solution. So a child has a memory disability, I'm going to give the child a planner, I'm going to give the child a calendar, I'm going to start helping the child be more organized. Uh, it's very important when you have a 
this ability to start writing everything down. That's a major, major uh, accommodation for a memory disability. Uh, the problem is you give a child a planner because they have a memory problem, they forget to use the planner, or they lose the planner. So a lot of times the disability interferes with the solution. So you have to really be on a child like that. You have to really help them get in a routine, maybe by several planners, maybe always every day check that the child has a planner, and do this for months because the child isn't going to remember something because you went over it a few days or maybe even a few weeks. You have to catch the problem in August, September, October, and, and keep driving what the child needs to do in, in a positive way. Um, un until the spring when it's just become so routine that the child now has this positive habit. I'm going to write things down, I'm going to be very organized, and that's something I'm going to want to do all my life. So the nice thing about J-Robot is it helps you catch that disability and then you can deliver accommodations. Um, writing things down is not a complex accommodation but getting the child in a routine where they're going to be doing this on a regular basis, that requires a lot of work. Okay, let me show you a feature that is going to save you a lot of time. You're going to love this feature. JRobot can give tests, and there are four pre-tests or post-tests that you can give. You can give quarterly tests, and then there's also a 30 question end of course exam or a 60 question end of course exam and I'll go over this part in a moment but let me show you the benchmark test uh, you have astronomy geology hydrology and meteorology or energy resources and conservation I'm going to pick astronomy I'm going to enter my name and I'm going to take the pretest and you will see that it's written uh, in similar language to the Georgia milestones and this tests the Georgia sixth grade science standards it doesn't go beyond it doesn't leave anything out it's a very accurate measure of what students in Georgia need to learn so if I have children with a read aloud accommodation I would pass out headphones just to those students and I'd instruct them to click the read to me button and every test question would be read to them um, nice and slowly and then the students who don't have a read aloud accommodation they would not get headphones and they'd be instructed not to click that button and because they don't have headphones if they did click this button they would immediately get my attention uh, look at this photograph the name of this planet is Earth this is Jupiter. Let's say I am a great student and a student next to me wants to copy my answers. Well, it's very hard to do that because once I click, the answer disappears. So this reduces cheating. It makes the test more honest. And of course, the computer program will grade everything perfectly. So no more mistakes uh, and inaccurate data. This really helps you have very, very accurate data. Notice some questions are five-part instead of four-part multiple choice. That makes the test a little bit more precise. And some questions are very suitable for a five-part question and, and some are not. Uh, if you want to skip a question, you can do that. And I'm just going to get through this really, really quickly. I'm not going to worry about my score. And... I'm just going to stop at one particular question because it's important. Okay, I'm going to stop right here. When I was a boy watching Cosmos by Carl Sagan, I was taught that the Milky Way galaxy is located at point C. Astronomers now tell us the Milky Way galaxy is kind of halfway between the center and the edge, so B would be the best answer. Wow, for years I've been teaching that wrong. So you can teach that right. The answer is B. Um, the reason we have seasons, now um, it's going to go over the skip questions. It's going to go back. It remembers what uh, I skipped. And oh, look at that. I got a 95 even though I was going really, really quick. 
Now this is really important. It says, please call your teacher over so that your grade can be recorded in the grade book. You must do this. You must bring a grade book with you when you're going to do testing with the students. The software is not going to record the grade. It's not going to send you the grades later via the internet. It doesn't have that feature. Um, instead, when JRobot is turned off or when the computer is turned off, it will erase those scores forever. So it's very important that you tell the students never turn JRobot off, never turn the computer off. When you get your score, raise your hand silently and I'll come over and I'll write down the score. If a student gets a really low score, sometimes they're too embarrassed to do that and they'll start using the software. If that's the case, use this little secret magic button right here and you can get the score off of this screen. If the students are done early, I used to have a problem where some people would get done really, really quickly um, and they'd have nothing to do. Maybe I'd pass out crossword puzzles or have them draw, but no more. You can have them go to a lesson. I could say, um, when you're done with the software, make sure you go to the Milky Way lesson and they have something they can be working on silently while the rest of the class is still taking their test. And we just went over the answer is not C or D, the answer is B. And if I get it wrong, it's going to tell me that's incorrect. And now I have it correct. And if I'm a teacher walking around and I realize this person never gave me their score, whenever there's a quote in between lessons, there's also a magic button. It's always on the middle right side. When I click it, there's the score. If a student's in the middle of a lesson, I have to wait till they get to the quote, and then I can always see what their score is and the other activities that they're doing today. Okay, I'm going to start J-Robot again to show you something else. Uh, end of course exam. Um, this is really nice in August. It's nice to give this exam, and then in March you give the exam again, or maybe in May you give the exam, and now you have a measurement of growth. You can see who's been learning a lot in your class and who's, who has not been doing a lot. Also in March, if you give the end of course exam, you now have an accurate measure of who is at risk of failing the Georgia milestones. So that is really, really useful to know. Um, as a special education inclusion teacher, I would have some students that would have an extra time accommodation. They'd get double time. So this software has a feature for that. If you do not have the extra time accommodation, I'm going to instruct you to take the 60 question exam. But if you have the uh, extra time accommodation, you're going to select the 30 question exam. And at the end of the period, uh, everybody should have enough time to complete the test. Some people say to me, there's no way my students can take 60 questions in one class period. But because you don't have to fill in circles, it actually uh, goes a lot, lot faster because you're just clicking answers. So 60 questions is very manageable. And if you need a little bit more time, 30 questions is very manageable. It's very possible to do that in a 45-minute uh, time span. Almost all of my students get the test done. So that is a nice feature. Um, the 30 question and 60 question exam are of equal difficulty. So in other words, I don't make the test easier for my students with an extra time accommodation. I set a high bar for everybody. Okay, we're near the end of the tutorial. Just a few extra tips for using the software. Um, the software does not require a password, and that's important. The students need to sit down at the computer and begin learning science right away. They shouldn't be shuffling through their paperwork, looking for a code, or they shouldn't have a difficult time navigating and finding the software. Your IT person should put the icon directly on the desktop, and that goes for all of your educational software. It should be easy to use, easy to get started with it, so that any stress or, or struggle is, is due to learning instead of the technology delivering extra burden to the student. Um, 
some students using the software will have some struggles, they'll get frustrated. Um, it's important that you don't have the student give up. You can switch, maybe they're doing uh, astronomy and they're really just having a hard time with it and see that they have a frown on their face. In that case, maybe switch to a different lesson of J-Robot, something that's a teaches in a very different way. Um, you can go from astronomy to the Big Bang Theory uh, because they teach in very, very different ways and you might find one way is more suited for the student than the other. But then the next day, I always have a couple student computers in my classroom. I have the struggling students go back to the lesson that they were struggling with. So the, the message is just because it's hard doesn't mean we're going to give up, but we are going to take a day break and let you go back to it again and again until you start to master it. I've had a few students that hated J-Robot on day one and day two. They couldn't do it at all. And after a couple of weeks, it became their very favorite software. And they just started to be one of the best people in the class with it. So that's great when you can take something that's really difficult and a real struggle and suddenly that path becomes smooth and easy. The students love that. That's a big confidence builder as well. Uh, J-Robot is not on the internet. So if the internet is down for some reason, J-Robot will still work. I remember a couple times I was going to do a brain pop lesson and the internet was down. So J-Robot was a good backup. Sometimes students will go on the internet Anyway, they'll be a little bit sneaky, and I come around and I see this little white line below, and when I put the cursor over Google Chrome, I see that they're on YouTube. And I say, what are you doing? The rule was no going on the internet. And they say, oh, well, I just wanted to listen to music while I do J-Robot. But I have a strict rule in my classroom that you may not listen to any music or anything else while using J-Robot. I've done a lot of research, I've done a lot of experiments, I've had students use J-Robot while they're listening to Mozart and Beethoven or rap music or their, their favorite music, and none of that works as well as silence. It's very important that silence is used strategically in a classroom, especially a special education classroom. So when we do reading, it's absolute silence. When we're doing J-Robot, it's absolute silence. Uh, that's really, really important. Well, that is the J-Robot tutorial. I hope you found this information valuable. I hope I've answered your questions. Uh, there's a lot more features for J-Robot, but I, I suggest you use it and watch how your students use it. And, and the rest of it's kind of self-explanatory. However, if there's a question I didn't answer, I, I do welcome you to email me. You can email me at david at jrobot.com. I would be happy to hear from you. And have a great school year. Uh, I wish you the best of luck in making a difference in the lives of children. I hope that they do very well this year, and I uh, wish you the very best. Thank you.